here to learn about these tiny little um, things, these vegetables and herbs, and I am so excited everyone is here. So for um, the agenda we have today, uh, we have the land acknowledgement, uh, and I'm going to get into what are microgreens, um, benefits of growing microgreens, um, and why you should choose to, um, different types and their flavor profiles, um, and how to grow indoors, and then I'll get into uh, closing remarks. So um, for the um, land acknowledgement, we would for would like to first acknowledge that the sacred land in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the um, Anishinaabeg, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, this territory is covered by the Dish With One Spoon, uh, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the uh, Anishinaabeg and the Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Um, Black Creek Community Farm recognizes that the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, uh, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this uh, land, Turtle Island. In light of recent events surrounding the thousands of indigenous children who were stolen from their families and then placed in residential schools, it is important to listen, educate, and understand how as settlers, uh, we contribute both consciously and subconsciously to uh, these systems of oppression and injustice. Okay. So before we get into what microgreens are, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Ren. I am a placement student with the uh, farm education team. I'm currently doing my social service work degree at George Mount College. Um, and I'm looking to get into like policy writing, writing around like food justice and food sustainability. Um, I am always researching ways to maintain uh, food sustainability within like low income areas. Um, I like to knit whenever I get the chance and I enjoy like easy, fun gardening um, methods. And yeah, so microgreens are the in-between phase between a uh, sprout and a baby green. Um, so they happen usually way before a plant matures. Um, they're typically herbs and uh, vegetables. They're, they often get confused with sprouts and baby greens, but the difference is that sprouts have a shorter grow rate and do not have leaves. Um, baby greens are a bit more tender and are nutritiously closer to um, their mature plant. Uh, where uh, uh, microgreens are harvested from the leaves and can be grown through mediums such as like soil, um, natural, natural fiber pads. Uh, they, they typically have a longer grow time than sprouts and they can grow up to 7.5 centimeters, uh, which is like three inches and are densely packed with uh, flavor and nutrition. So here's just like a little like, I guess like visual of uh, sprouts, microgreens and baby greens. You can see how the sprouts look like and the microgreens are a bit more of like an advanced version of a sprout with the leaves um, growing on top and baby greens are like way leafier and way, they look way closer to a mature plant. Um, this is also like a growth stage of like a broccoli which kind of shows like how they're edible in all stages. So you see the sprouts, the microgreens, the baby greens and the maturity and flowers. So it's basically like um, the edible stages of a broccoli and the different growth rates and the days that they grow and are ready to harvest, which is pretty cool. Um, so a brief history of microgreens is that they've always been around, but I would say that they became more popular um, within the chef scene in like the 1990s with um, high-end uh, restaurants, uh, using them to garnish plates. Just one second. Um, so it made, it was like something that people kind of sought after, uh, restaurant goers and chefs alike um, to buy them from people. Uh, today, they, there is still research being done on like the sustainability of microgreens and how like that can microgreens 
I grow microgreens and selling microgreens can um, impact the future of food, uh, sustainability world worldwide, and like how it can impact how restaurants buy these uh, microgreens. Um, right today, they're more easily accessible in the way that they're easy to grow um, at home. And if you want to grow them for profit, you can do that. Um, and today they're used as a way to like add flavor to dishes and they're used for the nutritional value as opposed to just being used for garnishes. Uh, and we can look at the future of microgreens. So, um, so there is a lot of potential for microgreens to kind of like impact the future and how we see food, especially for those who sell for profit. Um, locally sourced microgreens that are grown in soil opposed to another medium, they taste better. So they are in high demand for like people like chefs or like restaurants to buy them at like farmer's markets and farmer stands. Um, but the only downside to that is that it's kind of difficult to like transfer them. That's why they're very popular to get them like when they're fresh. So that way you don't have to worry about those costs. And that's why it's um, very um, sought after in that way. Um, microgreens are um, also paving a way for farmers uh, to grow efficiently through like hydroponic methods, which is like using a method that doesn't require soil. Um, they require less land in a way, so it's less land being taken up and they can also grow in a controlled environment. So uh, there's a lot of research about farmers using this method, um, the hydroponic method um, to grow microgreens and how that will look like for the future. Okay. So why should you choose microgreens? Um, so microgreens are high in vitamins, um, they're high in antioxidants. There are some that have like anti-cancer uh, properties or anti-tumor properties and are typically higher in these nutri nutrients compared to their um, mature plants. Um, they also provide something to do in the winter. Um, if you're like me and like have a knack for wanting to grow things, but like when it, winter hits you, like you're like low energy, this is the thing for you to do. Um, it's relatively simple to grow after germination and it can be extremely rewarding um, and it can be grown like literally virtually anywhere. If you're indoors, like an apartment or a bedroom that has a window, like anywhere that has like sunshine and a windowsill, you can grow microgreens. Um, the best part about these is that um, you can grow them in soil or you can choose a soilless method, which I will talk about later. Um, they all have different flavor profiles, which makes it fun to grow. Um, and some of them actually do regrow after harvest. And again, if, if you only have like energy for like one plant or like one, I guess like green food source, like you can choose microgreens. Okay, so, so different types of microgreens and their flavor profile. I'll get into the flavor profile first. Um, so microgreens tend to have a more wider flavor profile than their mature plants. So this can range from like spicy to sour, uh, lemony kind of flavor, salty and sweet. There's some to this that's described as like, it tastes like dirt or like very earthy. Um, and these flavors come when they are able to photosynthesize, aka come in contact with the sun or a light, um, which breaks down the necessary components for them to taste like what they're supposed to taste like. Um, what's funny about microgreens though, is that they can either taste like the mature plant or herbs are supposed to, or something completely different. So some popular microgreens to grow are like bok choy, radish, peas, broccoli, um, basically anything that has like a fast grow rate, they're pretty popular to grow, like arugula. Um, however, there are like other ones you can choose from that have like pretty unique flavor profiles, such as sunflower, which I thought was really interesting because I would never think that sunflower would be something that would like microgreens to taste as like sweet and like have a mild kind of flavor to it, but they do. Um, other ones include mustard, fennel, dill, carrot, watercress, squash, melon, um, cucumber, and uh, there's many more. So. Uh, on the left, we have pea microgreens. They're sweet. They taste like the mature plant. Um, they tend to regrow after harvest and they have a pretty um, relatively fast grow rate. Um, on the left, we have like an Italian basil. It is described to taste like the Italian basil, which is really cool. It's a bit, it's a tad bit more difficult to grow 
than peas, but it's still like, it's still pretty relatively fast. Um, uh, on the left, we have a red cabbage. It has like a earthy, peppery taste to it. Um, it's really cool because it's like purple. Um, on the right, we have broccoli. You can see that it has like a broader leaf than the um, red cabbage. It is described to have like a milder, crunchier taste. It's slightly bitter. It's also described to have like a deeper flavor than like like a broccoli itself. So it's really like a broccoli, but like times 10 in a way. Um, on the left, we have arugula. It's also a fast grow rate. Like you can harvest it around seven to 10 days after germination. It has a slightly peppery taste to it. Think of arugula, arugula but like peppery, or that's what it would taste like. Um, on the right, we have beets. It's earthy and described to taste like dirt. Um, so with that, um, I'm just showing you like a few, but with like a bit more research and as, as you feel more comfortable uh, growing microgreens, I encourage you all to try like different microgreens, either to say like you did it and you're like, aha, like I tried this one microgreen and it was really great. Or just like to like build like a flavor profile that's like really unique to you. Um, so I'm gonna show you different ways you can enjoy your microgreens. Uh, you can put them as a topping for pizza um, in your salad. You can add them to like your favorite smoothie mixes. I heard um, or I've seen that wheatgrass is like a form of microgreen that you can like juice. Um, that tastes like a, a grassier flavor. Uh, you can layer them in your sandwiches. They're also delicious, delicious in like soups and eggs and basically any recipe that calls for you to like add or garnish things, um, microgreens can be enjoyed there. So what I like to do is that like for salads, if I'm looking for a kick, I would add like arugula microgreens because like it brightens up the flavor a little bit and like it adds like a really cool like thing to look at, but also it's right, it tastes really good. Um, so yeah. So here's a warning. If you do decide to explore, I would advise you to like avoid eating microgreens from the nightshade family. These include anything from tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, peppers, as they contain like um, alkaloids, solanine, tropines, which is like basically code for like danger. Uh, these can cause serious symptoms affecting your nervous system and digestive system. So like, um, I would encourage you to do research before trying any of them, uh, just so you know what risks lay ahead if you want to try microgreens. However, microgreens are generally safe to eat, but then again, like sometimes there is, it's, it's really low, but there is a possibility of like uh, foodborne illnesses, uh, such as uh, salmonella that can arise if you like grow in improper ways or don't like do like improper, handle it improperly. So I would just, um, be aware of that. So now we can look into different ways uh, we can grow microgreens during the winter. So there are many different ways to grow microgreens. Um, I've seen people grow them on like paper towels, um, on, in like egg cartons, in soil, which is like the traditional method on microfiber mats, um, hydroponically, which is like anything that requires like soilless things and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on two methods, which is soil and a hemp grow pad. So before we get into like how to grow them, um, I wanna talk about what seeds to buy. Um, while some plants you or like some seeds you can use like broccoli seeds or like um, I think pea seeds you can use just like regular like you don't have, it doesn't have to be microgreen specific. I would personally encourage and recommend buying seeds that are organic and like free of GMOs and are specifically for microgreens. Um, just to make the process easier on you. Um, it's also important to note that certain seeds have different germination rates. So like smaller seeds might not need to be like soaked, but larger seeds might need to be soaked to kind of like encourage the seeds 
or encourage like the greens to like sprout out. Um, so I would read um, the seed packet just for uh, just to see what that might look like. And also I I would if you're doing it in the winter, you can choose any microgreens. But personally, I would choose like anything that like likes to be grown in the winter, like rocket salads, arugula. Um, but it all depends on you and how much sunlight you can get into your home. So the soil method is relatively simple. Um, it's personally, it is quite messy for me, but obviously choose what you, what you like to do. Um, for this, you would need premium potting soil that is around 80% organic compost and 20% uh, perlite. Um, so this improves growth on seedlings, but that's just fancy talk for like get premium potting mix that you think will look good or like think will be good for um, the, um, the seeds and the microgreens. You can also make, make your own, but that would require research if you want to do that. Um, but this particular mix is optimal because it does provide nutrients to help the seeds grow tall and strong. Um, with this, you can choose whatever you want to grow it in. So I've seen people use aluminum trays, like the uh, pie, pie plates, uh, seedling trays, um, takeout containers, basically anything that could be shallow and has um, holes on the bottom so it can drain well. Uh, you can, if there's no holes, you can drill holes, but I have a video on that. Uh, so with this, you put your soil in whatever medium you choose. What you're going to do is that you're going to liberally spread the seeds, like spread them out. Do not overseed because you can end up with like a clumpy, moldy mess. Um, how you want the seeds to get into the soil is up to you. You can pat it down. I've seen people like kind of like mist it down as well up to you. Um, in terms of watering, it is recommended that you water the soil and the seeds from the bottom. So uh, this is basically um, placing your whatever like tray or something like that over some sort of like another tray that's filled with like water, lukewarm water. Um, it, has to be, it doesn't have to be 1.3 centimeters, but ideally the water will be 1.3 centimeters. You put the, uh, the tray on top of the water and this will help hydrate the soil from the bottom. And what you will do is that once the soil feels damp and not soggy, um, you can transfer it over to like another tray that doesn't have holes on the bottom just so to avoid mess and also like it drips in the, in the tray. Um, and with this, uh, microgreens do have a three to five day blackout period, uh, where this means you have to kind of cover the seeds to encourage germination. This may look like putting another tray um, on top of the soil and then holding it down with like a rock or something that's weighted to just give it that like blackout period and like to encourage germination and make this, the, the stalk or the stems kind of become stronger. Um, for the winter, it is encouraged that you place it in like a warm area that could be like near a heater or a radiator of some sort. Um, anything that's any place that's room temperature, you don't want it to be over uh, overly humid because what you're creating basically is like an oven and with water and heat, you have the chance of growing uh, mold. So just be very careful about that. Also, it is key to kind of to hydrate the soil. Um, when it is dry to touch. So that whether that may be like doing the bottom watering method, um, spritzing it, but don't like water it from the top with like a watering can, if that makes sense. Um, because microgreens are highly susceptible to mold and mildew and other fungal diseases, you wanna make sure you get the watering technique down right. So that way you avoid that. Um, also in terms of sunlight, when you're done the germination process, you want your microgreens to have some type of light, either that may be a full spectrum grow light or a or the sunlight. 
um, to encourage photosynthesis because that's where the flavor is coming from and that's where the growth is, is coming from. So you want to encourage that. Um, with this for the winter, I know days are shorter. So some seeds do favor like a low light. I would say like arugula or like those like, like winter type vegetables. Um, and some of them flavor, favor like a lot of light like sunflowers. So I would just do my research on whatever seeds you have and then make sure you're giving the appropriate light possible. Um, I would say like a, using a grow light is like the best for like an even, an even yield. But uh, yeah, just make sure it's getting the appropriate light it deserves. So the pros of using soil, um, you get more nutrients from the soil to the plant itself. Um, studies have shown that it grows taller and stronger and is able to yield more for harvest. Um, soil is more affordable in the way that you can also you can recycle the soil and use it again if you'd like. Um, the, the, the harvest or the crop or um, no, sorry, the microgreens, they taste better uh, when using soil because you have nutrients again going in there with the, um, the compost material and the perlite. Um, it requires less watering and by this I mean like soil is able to hydrate the roots when it needs to so that's why you only water it when it's like dry to touch. Um, the cons of it if you are growing in an apartment and like you're just like afraid of mess like I am it can get messy like dirty messy. Um, if you are using it for profit like if you're going to grow for profit of some sort it will be harder for you to transport it because once you take it out of the soil, it's not living anymore. So it's easier to wilt. Um, and soil might be a bit harder to find during the winter months. I know I was like searching online and like, I think like where, I don't know if it was if it's cause where I was searching but there was like two left in stock of the specific premium potting mix that I wanted. So it might be a bit harder for you to find this um, during the winter months. And here's just a video just to summarize everything I said and probably show you a visual of how to grow. Um, just let me know. So do you have a lot of these laying around the house? Okay, sorry. We do. We usually wash them and reuse them. We use them for storage and stuff like that. But I want to show you guys. Sorry, y'all. What's going on? How to grow microgreens using really basic stuff, stuff you probably already have around the house. So let's first talk about the gear that you'll need. Two bottoms and one top. Some sort of- Oh my gosh, sorry. Keeps- Sort of potting mix. Pretty much anything will do. Some microgreen seeds. Today we're gonna to be planting peas. Some sort of lamp with a daylight bulb. Somewhere between 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin. It could be an LED, fluorescent, whatever. Just make sure it's a day- I don't know why I keep doing Daylight bulb. A drill with a drill bit. Don't worry about the size of the drill bit, just something fairly small. And a rock. You're gonna need a rock. Are you guys excited? I am. First things first, let's drill some holes in these two. Now we got our gear all ready, let's get our seeds ready. Some make a green seeds you need to soak for six to eight hours, or sometimes I just do overnight, I'll do it before I go to bed and then plant the seeds in the morning. Uh, or you can do it in the morning and plant the seeds in the evening. It's up to you, whatever works. So things like pea and sunflower, the bigger seeds you have to soak. If you're doing small stuff like broccoli or radish, things like that, you don't have to soak it. But I'm gonna grow peas today. So let's get these seeds started. So we got our speckled pea, that's what we're gonna grow today. I often grow speckled pea or green pea. And I'm gonna use a third of a cup of seeds. And I'm just gonna put it in another Tupperware here. Soak it in some water. So we'll let this sit for six to eight hours and then we'll plant our seeds. So the seeds have been soaking, let's plant them. Here are the seeds that have been soaking. I'm gonna dump the water out and rinse them once. Could use a strainer, but the hand is pretty effective as well. Here you go, seeds are ready to go. Take one of your trays with holes in it, add some soil. Not too precise, just level it off. And then we're gonna pack it down a little bit. I'm gonna water it with this wand here, but you could easily do this in your sink in the kitchen. 
let their water drain out, add the seeds on the surface. Spread them out. Give it a little bit more water. Looking good. Now take the other bottom tray that has holes in it and put it on top. Then take your rock and put it on top. Then take the lid and put it underneath everything. And there you have it. The rock is gonna keep pressure on the seeds to help them germinate. And if you don't know what germinate means, it means the seeds just start to grow. So we're gonna put this somewhere inside and out of the way. I'm gonna put this on my desk in my office, but it can easily be in your kitchen, wherever else you have space. Just wanna keep it at room temperature for a couple days, and we're gonna check on it. All right, so here we go. This is three days after I planted this, and if I take the top part off here, you can see that the seeds have germinated and they're starting to push up a little bit and that's perfect. So this is three days in and different kinds of microgreens will grow at different rates. So somewhere between two and four days. So now what we have to do is keep the light on it and we're gonna water it. So this tray on the bottom, I'm gonna use as a bottom waterer, which is what I do for my bigger microgreens. So I'm just gonna put some water on the bottom here. This is really nice because it waters it really evenly and it doesn't get everything wet. All right, so here's that light setup, and I like to leave my light on for about 16 hours a day, so you can just turn on when you wake up and turn off before you go to bed, or if you wanna be fancy, you could buy a little appliance timer and that would take all the guesswork out of it. But there you go, and just, uh, if there's no water underneath, add a little bit of water, and you know, probably for the peas, it'll be right in about four days. If you're doing sunflower or some of the other ones, probably about seven days growing. And that's all there is to it, we'll check back on it. So it's been seven days since we planted these. They're ready to eat, and they look amazing. We grow a lot of microgreens here at Satin Hill Farm, as you can see behind me here. But I want to make this video to show you how easy it is to grow microgreens at home using basic stuff you have laying around the house. So when you're ready to eat them, just take a pair of scissors or knife or whatever, just cut it right above the base of the plant, and you're good to go. I would only cut what you're gonna need for that meal and let the rest grow, that way it stays fresh. And sometimes after you cut it, it might even regrow a little bit. You may be able to get a second cut. You can see how easy it is to grow microgreens, so give it a shot. Hope you enjoyed this. Okay, so video. Thanks. Sorry about that. So that's just wrapping up. Um, how to grow in soil. And now I'm just gonna talk about uh, the hemp grow pad method. Thank you so much for watching. All right. So basically what a hemp grow pad is, it's a growing medium ideal for um, microgreen sprouts. Uh, they're most commonly used in hydroponic growing and are made out of biodegradable materials, uh, which is good for like uh, composting and they are highly absorbent. Uh, they, however, they're only meant to be used, used uh, once. Um, so this is a neater option uh, if you don't want to deal with uh, soil. However, if you do require, this does require a bit more of watering. Um, in that way, it's a little bit more high maintenance. So what you're gonna do is that you're going to um, soak the grow pad of your choice, uh, place it in a container, uh, baking dish, whatever you have that's around the house. You're gonna spread the seeds liberally. Um, remember not to overseed the mat. Uh, cover dish uh, with a cover plate um, or a plastic wrap, or you can do the same process of like putting an opaque tray over and putting a heavy object on top and having it germinate for three to five days. Um, you can hydrate the surroundings if you're doing this method, just so you know there's enough water for this germination method. Um, I like to just do like the basic, to put it over, um, like put a cover over and putting it near a windowsill and waiting till uh, sprouts grow. Um, so after some sprouts have been spotted, um, you can uncover and like water it daily. However, is that, however, the difference between this and soil is that you don't need drainage holes for the trays and that it is also highly absorbent. Um, just one second. Uh, so it absorbs the water 
Um, this is where it becomes a bit tricky because you don't know. Sometimes it's really hard to gauge when it's time to water it. So um, with that, in terms of sunlight, also depends on the type of seeds you're getting. Um, like arugula might take less time in the sun as opposed to like sunflower. So just read your packet. So, so the pros of um, using a grow hemp pad is that it's not as messy. Um, you can buy kits that already has a hemp pad inside of it. Um, if you're choosing to just buy it on its own, it's rather easily accessible. Like you can get it online somewhere. Um, I saw, I just checked recently and they have a bunch of them in stock. And with that, you can just put them in like a glass container. It works well indoors. It has a high absorbency rate. Um, it also is transferable. So if you are growing for profits, um, you can like give off like, you can give off the microgreens growing on top of the mat and only taking it when you need it. So it's more of a chance that it's fresher than if you were to use it with soil. Um, and it is compostable after use. So cons, like I said, because of the high absorbency rate, you're going to need to water it a bit more often than you would with like um, with soil. Um, it does not yield as much as the soil method. So you may end up with less to harvest. Um, I researched that it does not have like the most optimal taste that um, it would with soil, but I think it tastes fine, but maybe it's a bit more fresher with soil. Um, there's a higher chance of developing mold if it is overwatered. And also um, it does not fare well with some seeds. So I know sunflower for a fact does not uh, fare well with um, a hemp grow pad. So just like do your research before investing in time. Also, it could get quite costly as it is a one-time use. Um, you might just like end up throwing it out or something like that. Um, because if you were to use it again, like it could deteriorate and it won't be as absorbent. So yeah, that's the cons. And I have another video of how to grow. And I'll keep doing this until I know that it is thoroughly soaked. I may have to do it once or twice, keep turning it around. And then what I'll do is any of the excess water here, I'm just gonna pour it back into my container. And I know that I've got everything there. If you miss out on any spots on, on your mat and you can see it, all right, then all you have to do is to spray on it. And that should do the trick, okay? So that's step two, right? We don't need this anymore, so we'll put this aside for now. So now that you've got this all soaked and uh, ready for your sewing, all you need to do now is to take off your seeds from your seed pack and pour it into your mat. I'm going to take my arugula seeds and I am now going to sow my seeds onto the mat here. All right. And really all you need to do is, and it takes a bit of practice, but once you get the hang of it, is just, just start sowing it until the seeds come out and you have a nice big blanket of seeds on your mat. And as you can see, I still have enough seeds in here for me to sow probably another, I don't know, three times. I want to make sure that the seeds are properly lodged onto the mat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a nice spray. I'm going to make sure that it's nice and moist. So that's basically it. I've got my seeds and I've got them soaked nicely. I've got enough seeds here. Now what I want to do is to give it the blackout period. So I've got a similar um, container here, which I'm going to use to close this and give it the blackout period. So this is going to stay here in this way for about three days. Um, and then we'll see that it starts to germinate. And this is basically how you sow your seeds. And this, as you can see now, um, our seeds have germinated and you can see that it's all yellow and it's growing. So the hemp mat is still moist. It's nice and moist, you can see. And look at the underground. The roots have started to grow. What I would do now is to give it another 
spray of water just to keep it moist to ensure that it's moist and I'm not going to open it yet all right I'm not going to open it out to the Sun I'm not going to uncover it yet what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the cover which um, I had used to do this and I'm going to turn it around the other way now okay so I'm just going to do it this way so, and before I do that I'm going to spray it with a bit of water just to keep it moist and I'm going to turn it around this way and I'm going to add some weight onto it okay so I will put two pieces of stones here that is going to give it some nice weight and the reason we do this is also to strengthen it all right you will see in the uncovered in another one or two days that the stems are a lot thicker and stronger we're now into day four since we sowed the seeds yesterday we opened uh, the cover from its blackout period and we saw that the seeds had germinated but what we did was we closed it back and added some weight to it now I want to show you why we did that if you look at uh, the containers now and if you look at this I'm going to give you a side view you can see that it is slightly raised here and the reason that is happening is because the stems are growing now. So let me just remove the weights here so that you can see what it looks like now. So I'm gonna remove it and you can see that it's got a really good growth now, right? Some of it is uh, depressed largely because of the weight, but I'm gonna give it a nice squirt of water again, just to keep it moist, keep the hand mass moist. It's grown a lot more. It's still very yellowish, but that's all right. It's because it's got no light. And once we expose it to light, they all will turn green. The state of the microgreens as is now, if you look at it, because of the weight, it is kind of, um, you know, bent and uh, not very pretty looking in terms of the way it's growing. But, you know, this is not really a problem because what will happen is once I put it out to light, um, the microgreens will start to, uh, you know, grow in the direction of the light and they will straighten out. So this is this is not a bad sign. This is a really good sign. It's germinated well. Um, the stems are nice and long and you know they're growing well too so I'm really happy with this basically that's it we've uh, germinated the seeds and they can now be exposed to light and I'm going to leave it out for another three to four days for it to start growing uh, before it's ready for harvesting so this is kind of uh, the stage where you leave it out and we'll check back on the growth of our microgreens in a couple more days just to see where it is at. Hello again. We are now into day five of our microgreens, growing microgreens on the hemp mat. Um, we sowed these five days ago. Uh, to be precise, it was a Saturday when I sowed the seeds on this hemp mat and it's Wednesday today. So that's five days ago. And you can see that I've got a really nice lush growth here after five days uh, of sowing the seeds. The stems are nice and, and, and tall. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the growth here. I could harvest them now, but I think I'm just gonna wait for another maybe two, three days more. Um, if you look at the microgreen here, this is, this is really the cotyledon that you're seeing, the two leaves on the stem. And I, I'm probably going to wait until the uh, leaves are a little bit larger, uh, perhaps wait for the third leaf to come out before I uh, you know, harvest the microgreens. So with arugula or rocket salad, it does take a little bit longer when you're growing it on the hand mat. I have found that if I grow it on um, a soil-based medium, the growth is a lot faster. It usually takes about maybe um, five or six days before it's ready for actual harvesting. So now, uh, if, you are, if you do want to harvest it at this stage, then it's really easy. Uh, what you need to do is have a, a little bowl or, or something ready for you to uh, put a container for you. Okay, I just wanted to show the, the process of 
um, growing on a hemp grow bed and that it's possible and that you have to keep it hydrated throughout the um, process because of the high absorbency. It's kind of scary, but when you do it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite cool to uh, get done. Um, and yeah, so he's just basically saying that it's a little bit, it's gonna take a little bit slower to grow it on a hemp pad, a hemp mat than you would with soil. So the yield is not as good. And I'll keep doing it. Okay, so things to watch out for, um, especially if you're a beginner, um, you have the risk of mold, slow germination and like yellow leggy stems. Don't worry, I made the mistake so you don't have to. Um, for mold, this is going to happen because the amount of water content, especially if you're using a uh, hemp grow pad, um, you're going to end up with a, a kind of quite moldy um, batch. Um, I can say this from first experience, uh, first time I overseeded, I overwatered, and my batch ended up really uh, moldy. I was frustrated. And honestly, this happens so often. So when you see it, don't get discouraged. Just try again. Um, to avoid this, uh, when you're using soil, um, definitely plant in trays or things with a drainage hole. Control the humidity around you. Um, for the winter, don't, if you're growing something, make sure it's room temperature. Uh, don't over like, over like, don't make it too warm. You could end up with mold. Um, and try using the um, bottom water method, as I showed you before with that. So just to like increase hydration in that way and make sure the roots are getting the um, water it's supposed to. Um, when using a hemp grow pad, do not overwater um, because your absorbency rate is quite uh, high. It's difficult sometimes to gauge it. Um, I would say a good rule of thumb is to water like after germination when it's like dry to touch. Um, or wait like one or two days before watering because like, honestly, it's, it's quite disappointing ending up with a moldy batch. Um, so when you're first beginning, you can end up with a slow germination rate. Um, so with this, always do your research or read the packets, your seed packets. Um, make sure you're germinated, germinating the way it's supposed to. Some take around like two to three days maybe like four days if you're like really pushing it um, and that's okay. Um, things that can slow the germination rate down could be like expired seeds or you're not giving your seeds enough warmth um, or you're covering your, you're not covering your seeds. Um, like I said, to avoid this, you could uh, consider pre-soaking your seeds according to your uh, microgreen packets. Um, add something that's weighted to your seed. Give your seeds a blackout period, like you saw in the last two videos. That's really helpful. Um, if you are using your soaked fiber mats, you can either give that blackout period and put the weights on it, or you can like cover it up with like a baking dish cover or a plastic wrap or something like that. Um, that should do the trick. Uh, you can keep it in the dark if you want to, just make sure it's room temperature. Uh, germination doesn't really need sunlight. Hence the blackout period. So, yeah, those are some tips and tips and tricks to kind of like get the germination process started. Uh, just cover it up, keep it warm. It should be okay. Um, and you could end up with yellow leggy stems. Um, so this happens when there is a lack of chlorophyll um, in your leaves because it's not getting enough light. Um, this can be fixed uh, by giving your microgreens. Uh, the appropriate amount of sunlight it needs. Um, so just make sure you know when the blackout period is, but don't keep it over the blackout period, which is like three to five days. Um, when germination is supposed to, germination is supposed to happen, uh, keep it then the blackout period. But after that, make sure it's getting enough sunlight. You can put it on a windowsill if you'd like. Um, you could also put it under a full spectrum grow light. That's probably like the best um, option. You can get that online anywhere if you'd like. Um, but if you don't want to invest in that, make sure you're putting it in the sun um, on your windowsill. Okay, time to harvest. Uh, microgreens are ready to harvest when you see that there are four leaves on them. Um, this is basically, you'll see the two baby leaves, which is called the codyledon leaves, which is the baby leaves. And then you want to wait until the two true leaves grow on top and that's when they're ready to be harvested. And by this, you can take scissors as you can see on the um, picture, grab it and snip it off. 
Uh, do not pull the root because you could damage it. And that is especially important if you have microgreens that tend to like regrow after harvest like peas. Um, don't pull it, cut off the scissors and wait until you see four leaves. And this is just like a, a graphic of it. You can see from germination, the cotyledon, which is like the baby leaves, and then the two true leaves grow on the top or whatever, wherever it grows, make sure you see four leaves. Okay, for the winter season, what's important? Keep your seeds warm during germination. Uh, people have, there has been suggestions to keep it near um, a heater, a radiator, or in like a pretty like room temperature room. Do not over humidify. You can end up with mold, that's not cute. Just keep it like in a good um, temperature zone, which is ideal is um, room temperature. Um, so uh, give it that blackout period uh, for germination if you'd like. And after that, put it in direct sunlight or full spectrum grow light. You don't wanna end up with bitter microgreens. And that's what happens when the, the photosynthesis, uh, when photosynthesis doesn't happen, it could be extremely bitter and you don't want that. So give it the sun. Like I said before, some of them don't require as much sunlight as others do. So do your research um, and give it the appropriate time it needs. Uh, also keep your seeds hydrated, keep your soil hydrated, especially if you are in low humidity. Uh, microgreens do not have a strong enough root system to upkeep hydration. So do it when you're supposed to, which is like after germination, when it's like anything that's dry to touch, just um, that's just the rule of thumb for that. And so there are many different ways to grow microgreens. Do your research, find a method that works for you. Um, this is meant to be a fun and rewarding journey for you to do and something to do indoors. And that's all I have today. If you have any questions, this is your time to ask questions. Thank you, Pete. I have a question. Um, yeah. I'm a beginner, beginner, beginner. Uh, and I'm just wondering if, are you able to store the microgreens in the fridge at any point or is that not something you do? So, so V says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, yes. You can store them in the fridge if you like them, but I would I would suggest doing that after you've like finished like the growing process mm -hmm. because you do need the, the photo, like you do need the sunlight or whatever you need to make sure it grows to whatever desired taste you want it to be. And then you can store it in the fridge if you like to. Uh, you can store it in the freezer as well, but the some of the taste will go away after a while. Okay. All right. Thank you yeah. so much, Ren. No problem. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a favorite microgreen. I like to uh, basil, arugula, and um, correct me if I'm wrong. It's like, I think it's like Trition, Triton radish, I believe. It's like super red and it's really cool. What's the best way to um, harvest the microgreens? Um, I've seen people use like knives um, or scissors. Just once it's like a sharp edge and you're cutting it, like you're pulling it and like you're cutting it above soil level, uh, that's the best way. Don't pull it because you could like damage the root system. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and how many times can you um, harvest your, your, your um, microgreens and then yeah, so it depends on what um, you're growing. Uh, I stated uh, peas tend to regrow uh, for quite some time. Um, so that's, yeah. So they tend to regrow after quite some time. You just have to do some research on whatever you want to grow. And yeah, you can do it through that way. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Do you know if cats or pets tend to like them because it just it makes me think that like that type of thing possibly 
I actually don't know. I actually don't know at all. I know I have a dog and I tend to like hide it away from him. Like just put it up top because he tends to get into a lot of things, but I'm not sure if they like, like the taste of it or like they like it. I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more questions? Uh, will this video or recording be on your YouTube channel? Uh, 